nations. Uh, he's helped us uh, tremendously. And please thank him. Pastors like to get feedback um, to know that they're being impacted, uh, that they are, excuse me, being impactful in their preaching. And uh, sometimes it gets lonely at the top, and particularly when you're dealing with social issues, and you like to get feedback. And so please make sure you would give him some feedback. All right? Let him know how much you appreciated his ministry. Um, I heard them welcome back the Southworths, but did they mention Daniel and Ann Boodoo? I don't think I heard that. They did? Okay. All right, I must have tuned out briefly for that moment. Maybe. Maybe not. Daniel and Annie, it's always a pleasure to see you. Please stand again. Uh, of course, this is the sister of Brother Trico and brother-in-law to, to uh, Anne Marjorie and, and Sister Trico. And, of course, they're here for the special time with Aunt Marjorie. And, of course, her youngest daughter, Deneen, husband, and I see two of their four children. Are the other two still here? Are they coming today? All right. And, of course, yes, they've been welcomed already, but stand up and be welcomed again. All right. You know, when, they, when, family, when family members return, you know, we, we, we may hear them reference from time to time. It's always good to say, oh, that's who they mean. And so it's always good to have them back. Let's uh, continue with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, perhaps the summer is coming to an end. We're seeing the pews filling up again. We thank you for those who have had an opportunity to be away, uh, to refresh themselves. Thank you for those who are making their way back. Thank you for every student who has returned and for those who are uh, returning and going off for the first time. We ask your blessing on this assembly. Thank you that uh, so many different persons, different nationalities, different uh, experiences, and even church experiences have made their home here at Grace. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to be faithful to the Word of God, that we would continue to have leaders who are faithful to you and to your Word, and who truly love and care for the flock. Thank you for the faithfulness of our musicians who continue to take time to practice that uh, they're not just performers up here, but leaders of worship. And uh, now, Lord, for the word that we're about to receive, we pray that you would open it up and lay it bare and give us instruction as to how we should perceive this word that comes from you. Thank you for the word that went forth through Brother Llewellyn Armstrong, powerful word to help us in our appreciation for the wisdom of God, though in this age it is foolishness to us, it is a power of God unto salvation. With all these blessings before us, Lord, we return thanks and ask that you would give us a heart of wisdom and understanding that we may receive from you. To this end we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. The message today is called The Transforming Power of the Word of God. Um, deeply grateful for the retreat that the young people went on and um, the emphasis on the Word there. And, um, you know, we live in an age where truth is relative. We live in an age where uh, you break open the Scriptures and someone tells you, but that's your opinion. And it's certainly not helped with the many translations where people can just even further use what someone else meant to bring clarity for someone to use that as a means to say, well, that's your opinion. Uh, I don't believe that. And so take themselves out from under the authority of God's word. We live in an age where politicians get their convictions from national polls. And uh, truth is relative on every front. But brothers and sisters, God has not given us his word to be impressed with, uh, to tickle the mind with and dismiss, but rather he's given us his word to be obeyed and for us to be transformed by it. I put it to you, beloved, that if your attitude toward, towards the word of God is one of opinion and suggestions that you will consider, 
that you're in sin, and I trust that by the end of our time together, you will repent of an attitude that treats the Word of God like a book of suggestions, but rather the Word of God. God didn't give us the Ten Suggestions. He gave us the Ten Commandments. This Word is a transformative Word, and the Scripture that we're going to read brings that out to us. I'm sure like me, there have been times in your life where the Word of God has hit you with deep conviction, and you realize, oh, th this is a Word from God. Uh, I certainly can remember, and I'm not going to go into that, uh, but I remember the time having memorized the Scripture, and of course you can understand in the church that I'm pastoring, Scripture memory will play a big place, and you can understand why. In my early Christian life, I came under the influence of the Navigators. The Navigators' big emphasis is discipleship, Bible study, and Scripture memory. But you know, you can memorize the Scriptures, and it can do nothing for you, or you can memorize the Scriptures, internalize them, and have your life transformed by their truth. I grew up a warrior. I worried about many things. One of my children is a warrior as well. I'm not going to get into which one, but, you know, there comes a time when you realize that you're only human and you serve a God who is sovereign. And some things you have to leave, actually all things, but we'll go with some things for now to get the point across to you. You just have to leave them in his providence. And there's a process by which that takes place. Well, I was worried to death. Uh, I was a student in college, and I had a father who worked for the airline so I could travel for free, or rather just paying taxes. Wonderful privilege when your parents work for the airlines and you're of age where you can still fall under that um, blessing, that category. And uh, the only problem was there were blackout days when you couldn't travel because that's when everybody was traveling. Christmas and times like that, spring break. And uh, if I was ever to get out of school in Peoria, Illinois, I had to leave no later than the 17th. Well, it was the night of the 16th, and it suddenly occurred to me in a moment of, of clarity and terror, you don't have your plane ticket. I'm talking 1980. Ain't no email. Ain't no internet. Or if it, there was internet, but not the way you think internet. No cell phone. Cell what? What's that? I mean, 10 years later, you saw a cell phone. A cell phone was about yay big with a big antenna. Had that big thing next to you. Yeah, hello? And don't try to put it in your pocket because it weigh you down. And, you know, long there was no Vonage, no Skype, no Viber, no, no FaceTime, none of that. None of that. This was an expensive, long-distance call I was going to have to make to my father. Dad, where's the ticket? Son? My family can relate to the son. I, I, I sent that some time ago. My dad is very formal and proper. Um, so I'm, I'm now, I'm at what, what DEFCON 4, you know, they call it when there's total crisis and the world is about to end. I mean, I am panic stricken. Dad sent the ticket. He said, well, 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 where is it? And, um, as I'm in the state of panic, panic, the word of God comes. Lyle, what does my word say in Philippians 4, 6 and 7? Uh, um, um, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Well, man, Lord, I ain't got time for that, man. Listen, my, my, my plane, my, 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 I don't have my plane ticket. I, if I don't leave tomorrow, I, it's gonna be, it's gonna be pandemonium. Uh, um, there's no way I'm going to be able to get this ticket in time. Uh, um, um, and and the, the dorm closes. I have no place to stay. God, you know, I don't have time for, for, for no scripture memory right now. I need, to, I need to figure out what I'm going to do. 
what does my word say, Lyle? And I quoted it again. He says, do it. <sighs> Exasperated, I say, okay, what does it say? What does it say? Be anxious for nothing. Now, that's an impossibility, Lord, because this is an anxious situation. Of course I'm going to be anxious. No, no, no. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, prayer and supplication, that's begging, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So I said, all right, Lord. And so I prayed, I supplicated, and I gritted my teeth and said, thanks uh, for something. I don't know what I should be saying thanks for because I am... But anyway, I, I went through the mo motions, and, and then I went through it again, and I began to get a little bit more relaxed. And the Lord says, go to bed. I said, Lord, it's 9 o'clock. What are you talking about? I have three more hours to worry and figure out what I'm going to do. And Okay, Lord, I get it. So I, I, you know, I went to bed. The plane left around 1 o'clock, so I, I knew I had to leave around a certain time to get to the plane. 9-11 hadn't happened yet, so you didn't need to be there no two hours in advance. Um, and so I remember as I was coming out of sleep, the Lord said, Lyle, get up, go to your drawer, and search in the back of your drawer. I said, Lord, I did that three times last night before you send me to bed. Ain't nothing there. The Lord says, get up and do it. Jumped off my bed, went there, put my hand in the back. I say, see, Lord, no further. What's that? I pulled it out. There was my ticket. The ticket had come in some time before. I'd put it away and forgotten I'd put it away. Whew. What a relief. Next year, same thing happened. This time I know I didn't have no ticket. I said, Lord, please, we cannot go through this again. That, that really almost killed me last time. The Lord says, but I did everything. I prayed, and I went to bed at 9 o'clock. What's that? Superstition, right? It, it, was, it wasn't faith at that point. It was more kind of a superstition. But during the night, I said, Lord, I'm going to give this to you. There's nothing else I can do. Well, went to bed, got up that morning, ran to that side of the thing, put my hand on the back there. This is how superstitions happen, you know. I could almost hear the Lord saying, what you looking for, Lyle? Lay back there. I called the flight time. I had to be at the airport for the 2.30 flight. I had to be there by about 1.15 or whatever. I knew it was about a 30-minute trip to the airport from where I was. I said, Lord, I'm going to have to exercise this thing by faith. I asked a friend to take me to the airport at that time. He said, oh, did your ticket come in? I said, no, but I'm going to trust the Lord to do something. Um, and so I, I'm, 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 I go to the, the, the breakfast room and I'm trying to eat my breakfast and I know the mail comes in at 9, so at 9 I go there, no mail. Sometimes the mail's a little late, 9.30 I go back, no mail. I said to Ms. Stoll, Ms. Stoll, any mail in for me? No, 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 all the mail's in. Um, uh, maybe you can check UPS, they come in at 11. So I don't know what I did for them, but I packed my suitcases, got them all ready, told my friend, don't forget, now you're picking me up at such and such a time. And he says, you take it in yet? I said, no, but I'm, gonna, I'm trusting the Lord, believe in the Lord. And um, came there at 11, 11.05, just to be safe. I came in. Um, Ms. Stoll says, uh, no, it hasn't arrived. In fact, UPS is just leaving. And I watched them leave like, oh, my God, what is going to happen? UPS left. Oh, boy. I, I, I don't know what to do, so I'm praying some more. Lord, I left this with you. You know, your word says this. And, and finally I said, okay, uh, it's 1230. I got to go. Um, I saw my friend. He says, okay, the ticket came in. I said, no, 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 but let's go. Um, I start going in the car, threw my luggage in the car, about to pull off. Ms. Stoll says, Lyle, stop. He says, Ms. Stoll, what's the matter? She said, listen, the UPS man just came back. Um, he, he, he said he saw something. Uh, a piece of mail that got left. He didn't know was all about. Maybe it was important, so he brought it back. Here you go. Bam. She puts that in my hand. I jump in the car. I said, let's go. He said, I'll just go look at the ticket. I said, no, no, no. I'm too nervous to look at this ticket. Let's, he said, this envelope. I said, let's just get to the air, op, airport. Halfway to the airport, 15 minutes later, I open that, and there's my ticket. I said, boy, Lord, 
you know how to test somebody's faith. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, here's my point. God has declared his word. He's declared his word. It's a powerful word. It's a transformative word. And if we would submit to the word of God, we will be transformed and we will see the glory of God. The corollary to that is God declares his word. We question whether God's word is true and the end result is chaos. Exhibit A, Adam and Eve. A very clear word. Don't fool with that tree. That tree will bring you into a knowledge of good and evil. You'll be, you, you fool with that, you will find yourself in a world where bad things happen to good people, where, where a world is chaos, where there's sin within and without, where everything will be wrong. Yes, there will be some right too, but it will be a chaotic world. Don't fool with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That will put you in a dimension you don't want to be a part of. And here it is. Here's Eve, perfect woman, perfect environment, perfect man. Ladies, Eve was the only woman ever to have a perfect man. You realize that? Perfect woman, perfect environment, perfect man, perfect relationship with God. The devil comes there and in two questions, gets it and que question the integrity of God and the character of God. Ladies, watch it. Watch it. Some of you have men who are trying to be God's man. No, they're not perfect. Only Adam was, and he didn't stay perfect too long. But, but, but you know what? You know what? Stop thinking there's something better down the road because you won't appreciate what you have in front of you. Watch that. Watch that gravelicious spirit. Watch it. Watch it. Wake with what you have. You want a better husband? Pray for him. Want a better husband? Respect him. Want a better husband? Don't nag him. All right? But that's another message. Those, those, of you, those of you in my premarital, in my premarital classes, y you know how I could hammer away at those kinds of issues. All right. Today we come to the classic text on the power of the Word of God. It's found in Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. And you can turn in your Bibles. Well, in fact, you don't need to. I have it there in your handout for you. It's one of those scriptures I've memorized. What does it say? Let's read it together. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight and all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You heard that? Now, I didn't quote that because I know that in a different version, but there are some, some, the ways that this was said that I want to pull out and use, I want to use this particular version. Now, the section begins with for or therefore, tying what follows with what the authors previously told them about the consequences of Israel's disobedience. This comes from the book of Hebrews, where, where the, the writer of Hebrews is helping them to understand the parallels and types from the uh, Old Testament and how Jesus Christ is better than all of those sacrifices, all of that priesthood, all, all, even, the, even the, the authorship of Moses and his, him, 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 the lawgiver. Christ is superior to everything in the Old Testament. Everything. And they all point to and typify his work. And then it, it, um, the writer of Hebrews has just finished saying how because the people were disobedient to the word of God, they fell dead in the wilderness. They had all the power, all of the presence of God. They had everything they could possibly ever, ever want. And still they grumbled and were dissatisfied. As a church, let me help you with something. The greatest sin Moses had to deal with was complaining and murmuring. Don't let that be named in Grace Community Church. Now, by and large, that does not happen in our church, but every so often you get some sad who just want to complain. Don't complain here. Get to work. All right? And the worst thing in the world you want to do is complain, and you ain't doing nothing. I just lose my manners with that. All right? Because we're all called to be a part of the fellowship and to be involved in the work of ministry together. To complain and you're not doing anything is the greatest insult. It is loan to merity. And so, listen, 
chances are, if you see something to complain about, chances are that's an area where you probably have some specialization. That's why you notice that something's not being done there. And it's a good chance that you probably might be someone who's going to fit in that particular area. So stop complaining and get to work. Amen? So, coming out of this thing where the children of Israel were disobedient, murmuring, and complaining, and many of them fell dead in the wilderness, giving these kinds of illustrations, he says, listen, this is why you need to take heed to the Word of God. And he elaborates on the Word of God and this power. Today I want you to see with me some four reasons why we should not disregard the Word of God. The first, it says, for the Word of God is living. It's living. It's alive. The Bible, the Word of God, is unlike any other book you have in your home or in your library. The Library of Congress lays claims to being the largest library in the world with more than 130 million items on approximately 530 miles of bookshelves. Can you even envision that? Can you imagine how many, many books that is? 130 million items, approximately 530 miles of bookshelves. That's a lot of books. The collections include more than 29 million books and other printed materials, 2.7 million recordings, 12 million photographs, 4.8 million maps, and 58 million manuscripts. And by the way, these stats were from 1988. I can't imagine what they are now. Yet among all these volumes, the only ones that can lay claims of being alive and powerful are copies of the Word of God. Of all the written texts in the world, the only text that is alive, that is living, is the Word of God. This places the Bible in a unique category all to itself. The living word, zo, zoe, zoon, is placed in the emphatic position in the original language. The Word of God is no dead letter, but as a word of the living God, it cannot fail but to be living. God's Word comes alive to our knowledge. Sometimes we're reading the Word of God and it powerfully comes off the page to us with a rebuke or a word uh, to move forward in faith in some area. It's a powerful Word. As a living Word, it continues through each age with compelling relevance. Says Gypsy Smith, he tells the story of a man who said he had received no inspiration from the Bible, although he had gone through it several times. Brother Smith, I've read the Bible again and again. I've gone through it again and again and again, and I can't get any inspiration out of it. Replied Brother Smith, let it go through you once. You've gone through it, but has it gone through you? Then you will tell a different story. You see, friends, when you read the Word of God as, hmm, interesting nuggets of thought, yes, do, uh, um, uh, uh, yes, yes, the, 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 the divine uh, writers, the, 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 these guys, they wrote some interesting things. You're not going to be impacted. But when you understand this is the Word of God, it has a different impact. Says one Iranian believer, and this is right on my wall in my office, I read the Bible not as a duty, but to receive a message from God. Brothers and sisters, let me encourage you to change your attitude. Man, you know, I remember when I become a Christian, they tell me I'm supposed to read the Word of God because I got, you know, God got to help me and whatever. And it's a duty. It's a duty. This Iranian believer who uh, could be killed for his faith any time and any day, he reads his Bible not as a duty but to receive a message from God. How do you read the Bible, believer? How do you read this Word of God that He has given you to transform your lives? He says His Word is like fire. His Word is like a hammer. This Word of God is to have an impact in our lives, to transform the people that we are. Friends, if you're reading it as a duty, you're not submitting to it. It's a drudgery. Read it as God speaking to you, that he wants to give you a message. Are you merely reading the Bible again and again, or are you letting the Bible go through you? Do some work with the Lord. The Word of God is not only a living Word, but secondly, it is a powerful Word. It is a powerful Word. 
Now, the version I learn it in says, for the word of God is living and active. Active. It's alive. It, 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 it has power. It's, it's energy. Living and powerful. The word translated powerful is energes, is the word from which we get energy and energetic. The word literally means at work. Charles Swindoll comments, news articles may inform us, novels may inspire us, poetry may enrapture us, but only the living, active Word of God can transform us. I don't know of a more powerful illustration of this than the story told of how it transformed the lives, or life rather, of the men and women involved in the, infam in the infamous mutiny on the bounty. Some of us have seen the movie. Some may have read the book. But here's the basic story. Following their rebellion against the notorious Captain Bly, nine mutineers, along with the Tahitian men and women who accompanied them, found their way to the Pitcairn Island, a tiny dot in the South Pacific, only two miles long and a mile wide. Ten years later, drink and fighting had left only one man alive, John Adams. Eleven women and 23 children made up the rest of the island's population. So far, this is a familiar story made famous in the book and the motion picture. But the rest of the story is even more remarkable. About this time, Adams came across the Bounty's Bible in the bottom of an old chest. He began to read it, and the divine power of God's word reached into the heart of that hardened murderer on a tiny volcanic speck in the east, in the vast Pacific Ocean, and changed his life forever. The peace and love that Adams found in the Bible entirely replaced the old life of quarreling, brawling, and liquor. He began to teach the children from the Bible until every person on the island had experienced the same amazing change that he had found. Today, and the last time I could reference this was that day being 1988, with a population of slightly less than 100, nearly every person on the Pitcairn Island is a Christian. From one murdering, brawling, drunken, mutineering sailor who had been a part of murdering the other man has come this powerful legacy of transformation of all the lives on that little island. Yes, brothers and sisters, the Word of God is living and active. And so when we read its words, they reach out and touch the needs in our lives in an almost tangible way. Isaiah 55:11 describes Scripture as being a living agent or messenger that God sends to touch our lives. Listen to what God says in this passage. My word will not return to me void or empty. The word that I sent forth from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish that which I desire, achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So unlike any other book, this Word of God is living, it's alive, and it has power to transform we who would surrender to its power. It's why we hear so often in the Scriptures that when we hear the Word of God, don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts. You've heard me say from this pulpit a number of times, when the Gospel message comes through to you, now is not the time to deliberate. Now is the time to submit. You see, God has opened a door, a window, and a clarity to you. The Bible makes it clear. You can't even repent, but for God giving you the ability. Paul says this. He says, listen, pray that peradventure God might give them the ability to repent. So we need to be careful with this idea that, you know, well, you know, um, I finish all my sinning yet, and I like the scripture, though. I, I hold on to the scripture, but I finished sitting yet, My friend, that's a dangerous game. One, you assume and you can live tomorrow, where you can come back and acknowledge that scripture. Two, you fail to recognize the fact that your sinful heart will become hardened every time you turn away from the Word of God. And it's harder and harder for the Holy Spirit to get your attention. And so this living Word of God, we need to be careful not to resist it, for it is God's Word to us, given in timely fashion, to transform our lives. Thirdly, we're told that it is a penetrating word. We read, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing 
even to the, the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow. Like a sharp sword that can lay open the human body with one slashing blow, so the Word of God can open our inner life and expose it to ourselves and to others. God's Word has a power just to lay us open. Boom. And God's Word we see in the Old Testament oftentimes came through His prophet. Who can remember or who can forget when Nathan said to David, you're the man I'm talking about. And David was just thunderstruck. Man went into deep repentance. And we have Psalm 51 as the evidence of that. Oh God, wash me thoroughly from my sins. He saw his wicked behavior. Friends, I pray that we would call on God to truly expose who we are, for we are guilty of great wickedness against God and each other. Our attitudes need to be changed, not adjusted, changed, transformed. So may we make ourselves, lay ourselves open to his word. In the Roman wor world, there were two distinctly different swords. There was a large sword, it was long, heavy, and destructive. And there was a short sword that was lightweight, double-edged, and deadly because it could cut both ways. This is what Peter used to cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of Christ's arrest. What the author is saying is that God's word can reach in the innermost recesses of our being. No heart is too tough, no soul is too dark. When God wills it, his word can pierce anyone. As a certain Mr. Thorpe of the 18th century Bristol found out. The story I'm about to relate to you comes from a sermon um, given by C.H. Spurgeon, one of his messages. He tells a story of a band of men who call themselves the Hellfire Club. Now, you know they play it. They were the Hellfire Club. Their reason for existence was to mock and ridicule the work of the famed evangelist George Whitfield. On one occasion, the Hellfire Club gathered at a pub for such mockery, Mr. Thorpe offered his brilliant imitation of Whitfield, whom he and his friends call Mr. Squintum, because of Whitfield's eyes and the fact that he squinted. You all thought mocking pastors was a new thing. Oh, it's always taken place. Whitfield, Wesley, uh, Luther, many, mocked by the godless and those who shake their fist at God. Well, Mr. Thorpe delivered his sermon with brilliant accuracy. You can imagine them laughing in the aisles. Boy, he got Whitfield down, eh? Perfectly imitating his tone and facial expressions as he quoted scripture and Whitfield's exposition. Suddenly, amidst the laughter, he had to sit down, for he was pierced through and was converted on the spot. In the midst of his mocking, the very words he was speaking in mocking tones, struck him. Mr. Thorpe was a thoroughly nasty man, engaged in a nasty action, yet the word of God pierced his heart and changed him in an instant. Mr. Thorpe went on to be a prominent Christian leader in the city of Bristol. The word of God. I like how Psalm 119, 1 through 8, helps us to see and understand the word of God. The psalm writer says, How blessed are those whose way is blameless, whose walk, who walk in the law of the Lord. Listen to all the different ways the word of God is called. The law of the Lord. Verse 2, How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. There's a posture in reading the word of God, seeking God with all your heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Law, where we see God's special revelation as a gracious gift that points us to him. We don't need to walk, as the Jews would say, in the trackless ways of the desert, 
not knowing where to go. No, God has hewn a path for us to walk. His law, His righteous law and decree. We know how to walk. Thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a what? Light unto my path. Why is this nation confused about a simple issue like gambling? Why? Because we, we, we're not listening to the word of God. We don't want the word of God. The, these same people who are saying, you know, why doesn't the church be quiet? And they see gambling as a means to all. Don't they understand it's by the providence of God that the Bahamas exist? Don't they understand the sovereign hand of God that has kept hurricanes at bay and tsunamis that have destroyed um, uh, many a nation throughout the Indian Ocean and they still haven't recovered five, ten years later? Have you lost your mind? Don't these people understand that God has providentially kept this country? Not through luck and chance, but through the sovereign power of God? And God says, listen, you can trust me or you can let the love of money lead you to the, all kinds of evil. You can do that. You can let money destroy you. You can, let, you can let your lust for money lead you into all kinds of evil. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some eager for money have pierced themselves through with many griefs and have left the faith. That is what this is about. But we say in our constitution, we believe in the sovereignty of God and an abiding respect for Christian values and the rule of law. Friends, you don't know how vexed my spirit is. Known and self-confessed number of bosses are saying and advertising on TV how they could stop crime. You're committing a crime. You're committing a crime. Boldly. And the temerity to tell us how to deal with other crime. Worse, politicians are letting it happen under their noses. For God's sake, man, don't wait for the referendum. Listen, if you want to stop crime, legalize it. If that's what you want to do. But for God's sake, don't say let the people legalize it. You're dodging the bullets. And I say, listen, if you're not going to be serious about it, legalize it now. Let the people have their way and then have the referendum. But if you continue to let this thing happen right under your nose, um, gambling houses popping up every single day. Every day. And no one, no one, no one is doing anything about it. It is ungodly. It is against the law. But you know what? The police have heard. Oh, it is too big to deal with. And so their hands are folded. Well, I ain't talking about them set. I'm talking about the set who want to do good. When they get the uncertain message from the higher opposite, listen. Listen, let it go, man. We can't stop it. And then you get some fellows who have lost their way. They are like Balaam, guilty of the sin of Balaam, chasing filthy lucre. They are like Esau, sold their birthright for massive pottage. Listen, this situation vexes me. Where is the Attorney General's office? This law is being broken. These fellas, they... Cleverly saying web shop no more. They say web shop no more. They are, they are openly confessing to being number bosses. Some have rightly called them crime bosses. Friends, we can go that way or we can keep faith in God. Faith in God. Faith in God has saved us. What's your number money could do, your legal number money could do when the hurricane hits? And your money gets washed away in the flood. How dare these people buy their good name with illegal money, ill-gotten gains? How could they be allowed to be on TV saying the good they do for this country? You know what good the church has done for this country over the years? The schools built, the lives transformed and changed. Marriages saved, people rescued from destruction. That's what the church has been doing. And not with illegal money. And has been doing it for two, three, four hundred years. Oh, friends, when are we going to rise up and say this is wrong? 
Y'all got to pray for me. I, I just, I, I, I understand the, the, the scripture that says, and Job's, I mean, Lot's righteous spirit was vexed as he watched the evil going on around him in Sodom. Vexed. You know, you, you just, ah, 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 you're exasperated. Every day I get more and more exasperated. The brazenness. Friends, aren't you vexed with the brazenness of this whole thing? That's why I say, listen, please, since we're responsible to these young people out there, since we want them to know that we say what we mean, we mean what they say, I would prefer for you to make it legal. You heard me? Make it legal just so the people are not breaking the law. Now, you know I don't want that. But just so that we're not being such hypocrites. Hypocrites. And teaching people hypocrisy. Daily. I would prefer them to say, listen, we can stop washing our hands like Pontius Pilate and acting like we can't do nothing about it. Oh, jeez. You know what it is for me to hear the top officials say they can't do nothing about it? Well, then make prostitution legal, man. Let drugs be legal. Let it all be legal, man. Let us have a free-for-all. Let every man do what's right in his own eyes. Because you can never stop all of it. Let every man start beating his wife. You can't stop that. Let's just have a free-for-all, man. But let the church be damned. Round here getting in people business. I mean, you take this nonsense thinking to its end and you have a chaotic society. But the word of God transforms society. Under the ministry of John Calvin, this guy transformed Europe. Luther transformed the world because he came back to the scriptures as his authority. England transformed by the word of God under the Wesleys and the Whitfields. The United States transformed under the first and second great awakening. The word of God can transform man. Let's stick with the word of God. Not with luck and chance and dreaming and trying to figure out what fall. Fourth, the word of God is a discerning word. It is a discerning word. It is a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature, no creature hidden from his sight. And all things are naked and laid bare, laid open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. praying that one or two things are going to happen. That the people of God repent and come back to themselves or God bring judgment. I'm praying for the former. But friends, the God that I know and I've served all these years is not going to let a nation that says it serves him continue to live hypocritically so that the next generation believes in hypocrisy and they become further away from God. God's not going to let that go down like that. Friends, because he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah and every other nation he has crushed under his righteous judgment. And so, please pray with me that God would somehow turn this nation around. Please pray with me that, that the lawmakers and those who can do something about it will stop dodging this bullet, stop falsely washing their hands of this, stop saying, I can let the people decide. You know, we see, these scriptures, we see this throughout the scriptures, you know. Pontius Pilate could have stopped this mock foolishness with Jesus. But he washed his hands. Asked the people, well, who you all want? I'm indebted to this through uh, one of the church's letter writers. You'll see her letter appearing quite shortly, in which I get this thought. He put to the people, what do you all want? Thinking they would say Jesus. They said Barabbas. You don't put to people being led by evil people choices. You don't put choices to people when they're being led by evil people. When they're being influenced by illegal money. And the fellas them have the nerve to say they have sponsored both political parties. My Bible says a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and perverts the cause of justice. I know what your Bible says. But they have just said these people are indebted to us. And I have waited and watched to see government and opposition answer that. I see it yet. 
Friends, when your hand is clean, you don't accept no illegal money. One of my members were, were telling me, uh, they were having a conversation in the, in the country. They say, man, you mean to tell me your pastor wouldn't take no illegal money? My pastor? What year of my pastor is he? <laughs> say, if he, if he missed and take the money dirty, that ain't coming to Grace Community Church. And I have to ask the question, why aren't we all saying that? I ain't lifting myself up, but listen, I was, I was, tra I was trained on the word of God. I, I know truth from error. I, don't, don't tell me gray if something is black or white. Don't, don't try and put no relativism on there for me. Now you, now you can just get me vexed. And we're now living in an age that calls right wrong and wrong right. Evil good and good evil. Crime bosses on TV saying how good they are and fellas like me who put our head off get chopped off. That is the age we're living in. There's no respect for God in the country, no respect for the word of God in this country. Do you want that to continue? I charge you, pray for revival. Pray that this word of God would become strong in the hearts of the people where they would unanimously get up and say, No! We will not have Baal to reign over us. We are God's people. We will not let money be our God. Who speeded that clock? <laughs> well, I, I, I must be really vexed because I, <laughs> I didn't know I had uh, waxed eloquent in so many ways. All right, let's finish this thing up. It's a discerning word. God sees everything, friends. There is no escape. There is no escape. God sees everything. We want God to see us when we're hurting and when we're going through difficult times. We want him to see and come to our aid. But when it comes to our sin and wrongdoing, we would rather that God look the other way. Amen? We want him there when we're hurting, but when we're doing wrong, Lord, please look the other way. I don't need you to see this. But verse 12 concludes by saying that the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the very intentions of the heart. No time to get into that. But the word discerner is the word kritikos, the word from which we get critic in our English language. The word of God penetrates to the innermost recess of a man's being to critique and judge him. Secondly, God sees everything there is. There is no hiding. There's no escape and there is no hiding. Only the word of God is capable of exposing the thoughts and attitudes of a single human heart. There's really no use in hiding. Why is it that when we fear something is not quite right physically, we tend to put off going to the doctor because we fear what he's going to say. The same is true spiritually. The Word of God lays all things out. Thirdly, God sees everything. There is no excuse. The last part of verse 13 says, all things are open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The verse plainly tells us that there is a coming day of reckoning upon which we will give each give an account for our lives. The day of excuses will be over. The book of Romans tells us there's coming a time when every mouth will be stopped, will be shut. No, don't, don't, no, don't say another word. Don't say another word. It's only going to be an excuse, and God will not hear it. The Apostle Paul warns in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and each one, that each one may receive the things done in his body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Let me conclude by sharing something written many years ago by Samuel Chadwick. He writes, I've guided my life by the Bible for more than 60 years, and I tell you there's no book like it. It is a miracle of literature, a perennial spring of wisdom, a wonder of surprises, a revelation of mystery, an infallible guide of conduct, and an unspeakable source of comfort. Pay no, no attention to people who discredit it, for I tell you that they speak without knowledge. It is a word of God itself. Study it according to its own direction. Live by its principles. Believe its message. Follow its precepts. No man is uneducated who knows the Bible. And no one is wise who is ignorant of its teachings. Brothers and sisters, as we close our time together, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this word of God. You see, some of us, have treated it as a moral guide. Some have treated it as a book of suggestions. 
Some of us have evaded its impact. And some of us are living in direct disobedience to its teachings. As we would begin a movement to be revived by the word of God, I invite you to join me at the front to repent of an attitude towards the word of God that has been nothing short of godless. God says that we are to drink in his word, to love his word, to be obedient to his word. In fact, Jesus says, um, if you love me, you will do what I say. You'll keep my commandments. And so there's no getting away from the Christian being submitted to the word of God. I invite you to join me at the front and do business with God of surrendering anew, afresh, some of you perhaps for the first time, but all of us to come under its powerful living truths that we may be shaped by it. If you want to do business with God today, I invite you to join me here at the front. As we sing. Doing what's right will build our nation. Doing the things that pleases God the most. Walk in the light, not in the shadow. Say to the world, I follow and I'll obey. Uh, these guys won't always be with us, and it's a pleasure for us to, uh, to help lead today's service. Um, so just encourage us, pray for us, and um, let's worship our God. Okay, guys, we're going to start with uh, a call to worship. Actually, sorry, we're going to start with a prayer by our brother Giorgio. Perhaps those of you in the front may want to kneel on the on the uh, stairs. Just come forward in case anyone else may want to make themselves available. Move, move across. Okay. <clears throat> Shall we kneel in prayer? Oh God, we are horribly guilty of treating your word as a trifling thing, of treating your word as opinion, research, suggestions, and we failed to be obedient to its truth. Lord, we are before you this afternoon pleading guilty to the sin of pride and arrogance, of self-will, and desiring our own way above your will. Lord, we ask that your living, active, powerful word have your way in us. We pray, Lord, and Lord, I would extend this We pray that you would put your finger on our hidden sin, the things that are keeping us from being wholly surrendered. Lord, your church can never be ready to fight a colossal evil of greed and covetousness that is in your children. And so, Lord, free us of the deadly sin, pride, arrogance, greed, lust, avarice. Free us of those things that Make surrender to your word possible. Break stony hearts. 
burn away the dross of sin. By your Holy Spirit, come. Teach us to live right. Father, I confess I have spoken not of you or my indignation not represented. I confess to other people. Father, if my righteous indignation could be a rallying call to all of us to be righteously indignant about the things that are afflicting us, affecting our country, I pray, Lord, that it would be a, a model for us to respond righteously and correctly. Lord, we submit ourselves to you as Paul said, soldiers in active duty, not distracted by the things of this world, but ready to be used. Touch now every soul that has surrendered to you, every heart that has been open to you. Use us, Lord, as vessels fit and ready to be used. To this end, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, our service is over, but your service to the Lord remains. Go and serve the Lord. Be a witness. Recognize that you have been saved to serve him, not saved to sit, not saved to think, but saved to serve. Serve him in the beauty of holiness. Serve him with all that you have while you have time. I want to welcome back all the honeymooners. I believe Christy and Wendell McCarty have returned. Let's just quickly uh, welcome them. Uh, please stand and be acknowledged, Christy and Wendell. All right. Want to invite the mission trip persons to meet with Elder Andy right here at the front of the church. Thank you. We found a pair of keys outside. If you are missing, if you are missing uh, some car keys or anything of that nature. 